The ATC audio from the Greg Biffle crash is just published a few days ago. It's only a few sentences long, and on the surface, it sounds almost ordinary. Calm voices, short transmissions, nothing that immediately sounds dramatic. But there is one line in that audio that might change how we understand the final minute of this flight. Not because it tells us exactly what failed, or because it reveals some hidden emergency. It matters because it marks the moment when the airplane's configuration stopped being flexible and started being final. This is the point where configuration became commitment. This is William, and welcome to Black Box Analyst. Station traffic, station 257 Bravo Whiskey. Uh, we've got an issue with, uh, we've got an issue with uh, some of our, uh, I think, so we can hold takeoff for runway 10. We're, uh, we're having some issues here. We're going to try to turn back around and land at something like that. Now, before we analyze any single phrase, it's important to establish what this audio actually represents. What we're hearing is not a complete picture of what was happening in the cockpit. It's a filtered output, what the crew chose to say, in the middle of an evolving situation while their attention was divided. And the rest of the story belongs to the CVR and we're still waiting for the investigators to work on that. Back to the ATC audio, the most striking thing about it is probably not panic or confusion, it's ambiguity. We've got an issue with some of our things. We're having a rough engine. Those phrases sound vague, and that has led some people to assume the crew didn't understand what was happening. In reality, this kind of language is very common early in abnormal situations. When something starts to go wrong, it often doesn't present itself with a clean label. Instruments may not agree. Symptoms may come and go. The airplane may still be flying, but not quite the way it should. Early abnormal situations rarely fit neatly into a checklist. Checklists are built around clearly identified failures. What happens far more often is a period of uncertainty before that clarity arrives. During that time, crews tend to describe what they're experiencing rather than what they think the final diagnosis will be. That's why pilots delay labeling a failure until they're certain. Calling something an engine failure carries procedural weight. It triggers specific actions and assumptions. If you're not sure yet, you don't lock yourself into that path prematurely. Instead, you describe the behavior, roughness, vibration, fluctuating indications, power that isn't doing what you expect. That ambiguity is actually more demanding than an obvious failure. When an engine clearly quits, the problem is simple, even if the situation is serious. When an engine is running but not reliably, workload increases. You're monitoring it. You're cross-checking. You're trying to determine whether it's getting worse or stabilizing. At the same time, you're flying the airplane and planning what to do next. It's important to be very clear about one thing here. Rough engine does not mean failed engine. There is no shutdown call. There is no fire indication. There is no loss of control language. Nothing in this audio suggests the crew believed the airplane was unflyable at that moment. What this audio reflects is prioritization. The crew communicated what ATC needed to know and nothing more. They asked other traffic to hold. They stated their intention to return and land. They did not narrate their troubleshooting process because that's not what the radio is for. This is why ATC audio must always be interpreted carefully. It tells us what the crew chose to communicate under load. It does not tell us everything they were seeing, hearing, or feeling in the cockpit. And that context is critical for understanding why the next thing the pilot said matters so much. The most consequential sentence in this entire recording is a simple one. We're getting our gear down. At first glance, that sounds routine. Lowering the landing gear is a normal part of landing. But in this context, with everything else we know about the flight, this line is one of the most important clues we have. Lowering the gear is not just a procedural step. It is a configuration change, and configuration changes have consequences. The moment the gear comes down, the airplane's aerodynamic and energy picture changes in ways that are not easily reversible. First, drag increases significantly. That drag must be offset by thrust. If thrust is stable and symmetrical, that may not be a problem. If thrust is unstable or partially degraded, the margin becomes very thin very quickly. Second, 
lowering the gear changes, pitch, and trim forces. The airplane now requires a different control input to maintain the same flight path. That adds to workload, especially when the crew is already managing an abnormal situation. Third, and most importantly, lowering the gear reduces climb capability. Even a perfectly functioning airplane climbs less efficiently with the gear extended. When something isn't quite right with power, that reduction matters. This is where the concept of configuration as commitment comes into play. Once the gear is down, the airplane is no longer set up to maneuver freely. It is set up to land. Energy margins shrink rapidly. Options that were available moments earlier quietly disappear. In hindsight, this line ties directly to what we see later. The inability to regain altitude, the low, tight pattern, the undershoot confirmed by impact evidence. These are not separate events. They are downstream effects of an earlier commitment. It's important to say this clearly. The gear did not cause the crash. Lowering the gear did not break the airplane or create a failure that wasn't already there. What it did was remove escape options. Once the airplane was configured for landing, climbing away or extending the pattern became much harder, especially if power was not reliable. This is why this moment matters so much. It marks the point where the crew shifted from managing a problem with flexibility to committing to a specific outcome. Land the airplane, do it now, make it work. That decision makes sense when viewed from inside the cockpit and it carries consequences that only become obvious afterward. As soon as people hear that line, a very reasonable question comes up. Why put the gear down so soon? This is where it's important to step out of hindsight and back into the moment. The crew was dealing with an engine that was not behaving normally, not failed, but not trustworthy. That kind of uncertainty creates pressure to minimize exposure time. The longer you stay airborne, the more opportunities there are for the situation to deteriorate. There were also environmental factors at play. Weather conditions were not ideal. Visual cues were limited. Pattern geometry matters more when ceilings are low and options are constrained. In that context, the desire is not to fly a perfect extended pattern. The desire is to get the airplane on the ground while it's still cooperating. This is a very human response to time pressure and uncertainty. Land now while you still can. Reduce variables. Finish the flight. That doesn't make it reckless or ignorant. It makes it understandable. From the crew's perspective, configuring early likely felt like the safest remaining option. They were committing to the outcome they believed had the highest chance of success. This is also where some predictable misconceptions need to be addressed. One is the idea that the crew admitted an engine failure. They did not. Saying rough engine is not the same thing as declaring a failed engine. The difference matters, and collapsing those two ideas leads to incorrect conclusions about what decisions should have been made. Another is the claim that they landed on the wrong runway. Runway 28 is not inherently wrong. Let me show you something on the map, because this is where a lot of the runway 10 debate comes from. If you freeze the track early, out here to the west, it absolutely looks like runway 10 was an option. The airplane has altitude, it has distance, and it has time. From here, you can imagine multiple clean paths back to the airport. But now watch what happens as the flight progresses. As the aircraft descends through about 1,500 feet, the picture quietly changes. Notice that from this point on, altitude is never really recovered. The climbs stop being climbs. They become brief pauses in a net descent. This is the moment that matters. Because once you get here, low, close, and already descending, runway choice stops being a strategic decision and becomes a reachability problem. Now look at where the airplane is when the crew says, we're getting our gear down. That's not happening out here with options. It's happening right here, inside a tight pattern with limited lateral space and shrinking vertical margin. From this position, choosing runway 10 would have required more flying, more turning, more time, more energy. And energy is exactly what the aircraft no longer had to spend. This is why hindsight is so powerful and so misleading. Earlier in the flight, runway 10 was absolutely viable. But earlier is not when configuration happened. By the time the aircraft was committed, the only meaningful question was, which runway can we reach without asking the airplane to give us something it no longer has? That's why this accident is not about picking the wrong runway. It's about crossing a point where flexibility disappeared quietly and faster than it looked from the outside. Once you're past that point, no runway number gives you margin back. 
There is also the idea that the gear caused the crash. It did not. The gear didn't create the problem. What it did was remove options. That distinction is critical. Many accidents are not caused by a single bad action, but by a series of reasonable decisions that slowly narrow the path forward until there is no room left to recover. Now, when you put all of this together, a consistent picture emerges. This was not about incompetence. It was not about panic. It was not about someone doing something obviously wrong. It was about margin disappearing faster than anyone realized. An ambiguous problem, a commitment to land, a configuration change that quietly closed doors behind it. The ATC audio doesn't solve the mystery of this accident. What it does is show us very clearly where the final path was chosen. And understanding that moment is where the real lessons are. That's all we've got for now. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Fly safe.